going to do a 360 on you, Dan. I like that big conference room. What picture is that in your background, by the way? Uh, it's the Philadelphia, like, uh, row, row, what are they, boat row, I think they call it or something like that. It's where, like, the one of the Philadelphia colleges does their, uh, like, Oxford rowing. Yeah, sculling. And, they, and they, yeah, sculling. And they, they, uh, they light up that all those houses. So it's kind of an iconic thing around here. And back when I first started Dealer World, I didn't have a lot of money for art. So I bought that picture at Ikea for $39 and I've gotten a ton of compliments on it. So I just keep <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Ikea for the win again. Yeah, Ikea for the win, man. 39 bucks. <laughs> I like it. There's like a real Michael Goddard over on the other, uh, I don't know if you know who Michael Goddard is, but one of my favorite artists. And there's like a real one on the wall over there that was given me as a gift, but it's it's a little smaller, so we keep that one out of the ground. Very nice, very nice. I think we are uh, live on Facebook, but we are waiting on uh, uh, some attendees to, uh, right. to show. Okay, cool. Uh, so, uh, Troy, thanks for, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm in my office at in Lehigh. Okay. And uh, we have uh, a couple of work from home days for people just because uh, we're lucky that we're able to work that way. Um, so we have a rotating schedule and Tuesdays, uh, nobody here. Oh, that's kind of kind of nice. Everybody chance in the yeah. middle of the week so you don't have to fight the crowds if you've got something to do too. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's worked for us. Uh, we won't go down that road too long, but as we're kind of waiting for, for people, I'll tell you that. I was, uh, and I know you're a little bit like this, I think, but I, I was really against like work from home for years and years and years. Like I fought it and fought it and fought it. And then when COVID hit and we kind of had to do it, my team kind of proved to me that they were capable of it. So now I have a flexible in and out schedule. So we do meet in the office. We do have work here days. We kind of keep it, uh, you know, lighthearted and, and a, a bit of a rotating schedule, but it's working. Good. Well, we've got some folks joining. Uh, so Arnold, hello. James, hello. Julie, hello. Thanks for thanks for being here. So uh, we call this VinQ Accelerate because there. I think that um, the way to grow is to have uh, good mentors around you. And uh, Troy, you you continue to be one for me, and I and I hope I can provide some value to you as well. But beautiful, uh, my friend. <laughs> it's just crazy, right? Because it's. We, we get to be a part of this uh, ever-changing industry right now that feels like it's it's moving 100 miles an hour. Um, and it's a combination of, of, of ground game is what I call it. Things happening you know on the ground with either inventory or with personnel or even finding quality people right now is so difficult uh, to uh, technology just evolving so quickly. And it feels like the moment we're introduced to something, uh, sometimes we're already two steps behind. So it's, it's important to have a, a good tribe, a good circle around you to know um, um, how to navigate these waters today. Yeah, agreed. And uh, I do appreciate all the things. I, I, I talk about you a little more in the office than you'd think and uh, how much I've learned from you. So I appreciate it. It's, it's certainly mutual, my friend. Well, thanks. Well, so you didn't earn your stripes by accident. So that, I think that's where I want to start. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... What got you interested originally in in uh, automotive? We'll, we'll we'll hold on dealer world for a minute. I just kind of want to know yeah. uh, what planted the seed. Well, you know, I, I, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but I, I started when I was eighteen, so uh, I mean, fresh out of high school, basically. I owed my dad five hundred dollars, and uh, that got me interested in the car business because I answered in an ad for a salesperson. Uh, my the sales manager that interviewed me at the time was 24 years old. Uh, I thought, how cool is that? This guy's driving an IROC Z. He's 24 <laughs> years old. He's only six years older than me. I kind of like the idea of this business. Now, this was uh, not dating myself, but this was 1987. Uh, and I got the job because I told the guy I had read, uh, I think it was How to Master the Art of Selling by Tom Hopkins. Um, uh, and, uh, he said, listen, if you're 18 and you're reading that stuff, I'll hire you. Um, that got me interested in the car business. What kind of stuck me or, you know, got me to stick around was I paid my dad back after my first week's commission check. He couldn't believe it. And, uh, wow. you know, here I am all these years later, you know, still, still grinding away at the car business. That's cool. 
but that's, that's very it. cool. But yeah, really, the interest for me was hopefully I'll enjoy this thing. I wanted to sell. I wanted to sell something, and um, you know, it just quickly grabbed me that 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 first year. Yeah. So in those early days, did you ever think that you'd be in uh, in the business that you're in today, or did you did you think that you would stay on uh, on the dealership side? Oh, you know, I think my my I remember pretty vividly. Uh, thinking, man, I, I really want to be a general manager. I looked up to the general managers that I had at a young age. I, you know, for what it's worth, <laughs> speaking real bluntly, I just thought they were cool. You know, yeah. like I was, I was an 18, 19, 20 year old kid. And, uh, you know, these guys had a great life and they were running businesses. They had a kind of a cool vibe and energy about them. I was very lucky. I had some good mentors at that age that, you know, really, showed interest in, in, in me and, and told me I had promise and, and developed me through those years. And uh, I remember wanting to be a general manager. It was a goal of mine. So uh, I don't know that I plan to do what I do now, uh, but when I became a general manager, because that did happen, and in the height of my retail career, I, I was a platform manager, I guess they call it nowadays. Uh, back then we called it a regional manager. Um, so I oversaw four stores for a group that had 11. And, uh, you know, so for me at that moment is kind of when I started thinking, you know, a grander scale because I had achieved that goal. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I did it well. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that position. Um, but I really realized how much I enjoyed driving traffic and advertising and that part of the job. Um, and, you know, the consultative part and the idea of being able to help multiple dealers. Uh, I think that's when I started to think about what I do now. So that's interesting you say that because I had an epiphany when I was younger um, in just starting out in, in the car business. Uh, I really gravitated towards marketing and I really gravitated towards operations. Um, and I wonder if this is a parallel, but back then, um, and this is dating ourselves, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. That was the only place that technology really existed in the automotive space uh, because within marketing, you got to do syndication. Within marketing, you got to do work with tech companies, within operations, you got to do like DMS stuff, right? And that's really the only place that uh, technology actually existed. Or maybe it was the feeling of, of uh, um, having a bigger effect on the world or being a part of something bigger. Uh, and you and I have talked about that, right? Yeah, no doubt. And, and you know, it's funny you say that about technology. You're right. I mean, uh, you know, I think that enough time has passed. And uh, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this by saying, I believe that I'm still extremely relevant in today's world. But uh, I did yep, start I agree. when we faxed in credit applications. Um, yeah. I did start at a time when my sales manager didn't have a computer on his desk. So, you know, we could go on and on about the things that we've been through. Uh, you know, the first time somebody mentioned Google, uh, I was already selling cars for a number of years. Um, you know, so it's just interesting, these things that we've gone through. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah. And that, I, I think yeah, I know that's a strength for you. That's a strength for me. And it's a strength for all the people that have been through that and continue to, because that, that shows resilience, that shows a willingness to change, a willingness to grow, a desire uh, that to know that what got us here won't get us there. So, uh, and, and, and I think um, uh, that's how you run your company, because I am also a client of dealer world at country hill motors yeah very so, much appreciated and, by the way yeah and, and my, my team absolutely loves uh loves working with you guys so and that's also that, mutual <laughs> yeah well and so that was when when you and i first started talking about uh bringing dante and my marketing team along with yours the first thing you told me was uh we're not linear uh, what did you right. mean by that yeah. So, I mean, I, I, you know, linear could mean a lot of things. It, 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 number one, it could mean we don't just do like Facebook as an example. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I take it a little further. It's not, it, we don't just do advertising. You know, a lot of people look at us as an advertising agency and I'm kind of quick to correct them. We're a performance agency. We're a consulting agency. And we just also happen to be really good at advertising and can do all of your advertising as well. But I think a lot of what goes behind the advertising has to be the decision making of, you know, what's right for you, what's wrong for you, what do you need to do, where are you going to get the best ROI, you know, like as an example of our clients, you know, they'll want to do everything, and you you know how it is, you get it. I mean, 
Uh, it's not unusual for me over the years to sit with somebody and say, well, we got to be on radio. We got to be on television. You know, heck, some of my some of my buyers are still in the newspaper and I got to do Google. I got to do Facebook. I got to do OTT. I got to do this. I got. And you you sit there and you go, well, we'll look, time out, you know, and and your budget's X. You know, I won't pick on a number. Right. Your budget's X. And so for us being a non what I'd like to call a nonlinear company is we've had clients where, you know, really only one of those verticals is truly all they needed because the money that they had to spend in the budget was best spent on that one thing, dominating that one thing and, you know, allowed us to move the needle at the store without being in all these other places where they thought they had to be, um, you know, and, and being a flat fee agency, I think is part of being, you know, non-linear, so to speak, because, you know, we don't, we don't take, you know, any kind of commission from any media. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not getting radio, television, Google, Facebook money or anything. So we don't care where a dealer spends their money. It's, it has to be a wise decision of spending it where you're going to get the most results. I know as a dealer uh, early on, I, I used to call it witch's brew because there was uh, either the people I were working with didn't understand the the technology they were using to place my advertising or they weren't allowed to talk about it. And so I always felt that there was this uh, curtain between what my spend was and how much was actually going out into the world and being effective. And so the fact that you say you guys are flat fee and you're all about strategy first, you're all about results first. Um, I mean, it's why we work together. So, and I think there's uh, been a movement right. towards flat fee. You know, I don't know that we're that yep. special anymore in that lane, but I can tell you we pioneered it a little bit. Um, you know, in the days, especially when we were doing heavy uh, radio and television, we still do a ton of radio and television for what it's worth. Um, you know, that that department really is built out and the creative and 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 what we do there is is still extremely uh, successful for dealerships across the country, but. You know, when you look at not getting a fee for that, when you're not taking 15%, like we took on a client one time, spent $100,000 a month on radio and television, it's $15,000 that their old agency collected us at 15%. And our fees were nowhere near that number. And we were doing Google, Facebook, everything, you know, combined. So it really was about, you know, how do we help a dealer uh, be more profitable? Uh, there was just no reason to take fifteen thousand dollars a month on a hundred thousand, and you know, there's some people out there that might listen to that and get mad at me because they're still taking it. But yeah, there's, there's no reason to pay that, and you don't need to. Yeah, yeah, that's very smart. In in uh, the dealers today, at least I encounter uh, that I work with through VinQ are either they they come to us or they come to you. And they say, hey, just do this and we we'll the results. And then there's others that say, I want to know how this works because um, I want to be able to also have control over my business. Are you finding more dealers are getting to be uh, one way or the other? Do you find that they're going to be more involved in technology or are you finding more that they uh, come to you and say, hey, handle this? You know, I, I love the movement that there is more. Uh, people involved in technology. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's a blanket statement across the industry yet. Um, you and I kind of travel in these circles where, you know, we see each other a digital dealer and that, you know, brings in a certain, you know, dealer that thinks a certain way, wants to learn things, want, maybe has an internal marketing team even, you know, wouldn't need a company like ours because they got four, five, 10 dealerships or whatever and built that internally. Uh, and I even say don't need, you know, wouldn't need us full time, like maybe more consultative there. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I don't think it's widespread yet. And I think that that's a mission that I'm on uh, a little bit right now is the dealers that don't think that they need the data and the decision making, um, you know, the intelligence, the, 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 you know, the wiser spends and really diving and understanding, you know, where an OTT buy might make sense, where, you know, why to be on Facebook, why to move to text messaging, why to change that CTA button to not a lead form, but to a conversational conversion. Like, I feel like there's a, there's a movement for, for people like me uh, that, that we, we need to go out there and help those dealers. Cause what you said earlier, when we first started is, you know, technology is changing. The business is changing. It's changing. We feel like it's going a hundred miles an hour and it really is. And I, I, I genuinely feel that if some of these dealers don't make those moves, they're going to get left behind. As you know, I say this all the time when they start to have more cars than customers again, which will happen mm -hmm. sooner than we'd all you know think, even if it takes a year. I think when that happens, there's going to be a massive, massive shift in business. 
Um, so I'm on a march, you know, Danny, uh, you know, to go out and and push dealers to to, to be thinking at that higher level. So that's that's a good segue, and this is where I think uh, now that we've kind of laid the um, a little bit of of what you guys do, uh, the business today. So today, technology is is, and I'm going to put on my dealer hat for a minute. Technology is coming to me um, uh, through uh, calls that I get via you know through my business either solicitation. I get um, um, either 20 groups or or other fellow dealers that are that are doing things that. Uh, are areas that I may want to improve, but ultimately it kind of leads to the same question, which is as a, as a business, right? As Country Hill Motors, I want to be relevant in a year and three years and in five years. And I want to serve the needs of my community. And I want to do it in a way that um, allows me to um, connect in, in, in what many call uh, less friction, right? So do you think that um, uh, in today's world, if, if I was going to start in one place, um, where would that be? Would that um, be in digital retailing? Would that be in marketing? Would that be in my people? Where, where do you? Where would I start um, from your perspective? Okay, so I'm going to back up just for a second and say that the people should already be in place. The culture should already be there, right? Like if you're a really well-oiled machine and a, a strong business, and and I like to think that most of the time when I get compliments about my company, it's about our staff. <laughs> Um, you know, we just, we have a really good hiring process. We have a really good culture. We've got a great team. So I'm just going to kind of leave that for me as I feel like that's a baseline. Um, yep. so, well so said. people, yeah, for sure. But I, I'd like to think that most people have that one under control, you know, a place to look, uh, I'm going to start with the website and it's funny because it's something that you and I've kind of talked about and where we'll start, you know, with you guys even, um, I think the website's really important because, in our industry, um, tier three, independents, et cetera, we all have a website provider. And I'm not picking on website mm -hmm. companies because I want to be friends with everybody. But, you know, yep. it's a different it's a different model, right? Some of these companies have 4,000, 5,000, 7,000 clients, you know? And so when you're a tier three branded auto manufacturer's dealership and you've got a, a website provider that's got 6,700 other clients, you look at your website and then I beg of them to start looking at the disruptive sites and disruptive sites. I mean, Tesla, I mean, Carvana, CarMax, Vroom, Shift, Lucid, et cetera. These are companies that have a national presence, but they have one website, right? And that one website is managed by a team that maybe has more employees than their entire dealership. So I kind of beg of dealers to say, hey, if we know that, you know, 99.5% of people do some sort of research and land on your website prior to coming to visit you or whatever that number is, we know it's high, that I would look at that website experience and I would start thinking about how you work with your provider, with your agency, with your internal marketing team to, to take those platforms and, and revise them in a way that's really relevant to today's consumer because I'm telling you right now, as sure as I'm sitting here, there is a difference between how those 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 websites make you feel, how they interact, how they convert to as compared to a typical dealer's tier three automotive site. So yeah, you for know, sure. there's a big movement to move to digital retailing. Well, I don't know if you need to move to digital retailing. Let's talk about your market, your client. Yep. But there is a movement right now to say make your website more relevant and to put a put a an exclamation point on that for you, Danny. Think about the organic traffic that lands there. If you have 10,000 visitors, 5,000 visitors, whatever size your store is, you have this opportunity to take all of these uh, visitors that are landing on your website right now and make a, 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 a better experience, a better converting experience, a con an experience that makes them feel that you're in the game, that you're also relevant, that you're not behind the times, and I think that's really, really important right now. We're seeing some conversion rates when we do these, these kind of site overhauls. We're seeing conversions sometimes go up by 20%. And we're taking away CTA buttons all over the place. We're taking away pop-ups and CTAs and you know, all sorts of things and making it just clean, negative white space, you know, storytelling, yes. making a customer feel really comfortable with, with the experience. So I'd say 
start at your website. We know everybody's going there and your website probably isn't super relevant right now. Uh, yep. The issue is you need somebody who really understands that world, you know, and, and, and they're out there. Just find ones, find somebody who really, you know, truly gets it and then revamp your website. I think now is the perfect time to do that. Yeah. That's why I work with you. I just uh, want to throw in a plug there, but that is why uh, we work with you is because we want to be relevant. We want to, um, I think that experience uh, eats profit for breakfast. If you, if you have a bad experience, uh, it doesn't matter if you are a price leader on your inventory. It doesn't matter if you have the best inventory uh, you're not going to um, you're not going to survive. And I, and I also, at hey, least Danny, before you go any further, can I just interject? Yeah. It's also why I work with you. So, you know, I feel that VinQ, uh, and, and uh, again, you know, shameless plug here, whatever, but I feel that VinQ, the reason you and I connected was I love that product. You know, your and I relationship was born out of me going, hey, I want that on our websites that we're trying to make really relevant in today's society, because you have that plugin, you have that software, you have that ability to make the consumer feel like it is one of those disruptive, relevant, easy, you know, easy to do business with sites where you can get a true value on your car in minutes. And the, and the way that you guys go about uh, communicating back and forth with the consumer, you know, the red light, green light, yellow light, you know, just the whole kind of user experience is exactly what we needed that we don't build, we don't do, but we knew that we needed in order to kind of elevate the sites to that level because all of those sites have that, yeah. right? You know, CarMax, get a quote in two minutes. Well, and you do that, it's very similar. So you give us the ability to go to our clients and put on a trade tool, a, a trade evaluation tool, a sell tool that really, you know, elevates to that disruptive level. In my opinion, you know, that was the reason that we were really attracted to that product. Thank you, Troy. And, and so that that's a very good uh, point you just because you said something, you said many things that were very profound, but the, the thing that was loud in my ears is when you said, uh, they have more people manning their website, uh, these disruptive companies, right, than they do often manning their front door uh, because you're getting 10, 20, 30, 50,000 uh, visitors a month to that website, right? They might get and, a million or more. Right. And so on the, um, uh, in my head, I've been on this acquisition journey for a really long time because I think the way to uh, stay relevant is to have a firm grasp of uh, your acquisition, uh, people, process, technology, strategy, so that, uh, because I think at the end of the day, the, the, the companies that have the inventory are gonna have the best shot at, uh, at being innovative in, in, in surviving and thriving. Whether you wholesale, whether you retail, whether you auction, whatever your exit strategy is, acquiring it right is where that opportunity for margin lives, right? Well, building these vehicle buying centers and having a singular focus to uh, getting dealers to pay attention to not just buying cars, but what they should be buying um, is, is been what's been in my head. And then working with you to figure out how do we solve the motivators that the customers out in the world actually have, right? How do we, because the uh, there are still dealerships and markets that uh, simply say, we'll buy your car, even if you don't buy ours. And I get that. I think that that's been used, but different is better than better. And understanding motivators for clients and solving that problem is the evolution uh, or is the need that I think is uh, my generation, the younger generations, that's the currency, is how do we eliminate that friction? How do we buy their car? How do we speak to uh, their need in a way that um, has a, an, an end to end uh, uh, problem and, and solution? Yeah. And, and look, I mean, just uh, I'll throw out a, a, a freebie here for everybody. Like if you want to know what it looks like to be relevant in today's market, you know, just go to pedal.com, um, you know, and, and look at how easy peasy lemon squeezy it is. Right. I mean, that's their kind of slogan. And, uh, you know, we'll buy your car cool or not. Um, it's relevant. It's hip. It's fun. It's interesting. Doesn't feel tier three. I mean, these are the competitors. These are, that's another disruptor that we've got to pay attention to. Um, we need to make a customer feel. I, I just took that note. Yeah, listen, Pedal's an interesting site. They're not selling cars. They're just buying cars. And, mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they make it, like you just said, to a relevant, fun kind of, you know, hip way of saying. And it, 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 to me, I don't think that 
that doesn't resonate to I-65 either. He looks at it and says, oh, they want to buy my car. They're saying it's going to be easy. Um, they'll buy it whether or not it's cool or not. That means high mileage, low mileage, oh, too much, don't, you know, all of those things. It, it's a really relevant site. So I think there's a place for a marketing manager, or even if there's other agencies, you know, listening in on this or your dealers, you know, that's who you're up against. That's the kind of progressive marketing and campaigning that's going on from Carvana, shift room, this pedal, right? All of that, that you're going to be up against. Yep. So let's talk about uh, short game, mid game, long game for a yep. minute, um, from a dealer seat. So you and I talked about this the other day because we're, I'm always walking into the dealership thinking, what can I do today to uh, improve, uh, you know, 1% better every day? But then what am I doing that I know isn't relevant today, but will be relevant here very soon? Uh, and what am I working towards? Um, some dealerships think, are thinking about acquisition to buy more car dealerships. Some, uh, some are thinking about service. Um, what, uh, what are you seeing out in the, in the world? Yeah, a couple of things that I think are really relevant. One is acquisition. Again, it's kind of how we met. So it is what it is. Um, you know, we're an agency that has clients all over the country. And all of a sudden I woke up one day and my clients are telling me, you know, hey, I don't have any cars. Yeah. Um, I'm in the business of helping them sell those cars. So I was, you know, um, you know, wondering how's my business going to be. Um, again, because we're nonlinear and we're car guys, I mean, my staff has 136 years, I think it is, of retail automotive experience. So, you know, we sat around that table back there and, and we talked about it. And I said, look, the problem that exists right now is they don't have cars. We need to help them get cars. We, you know, it doesn't matter if we help them sell any cars right now. We have to help them acquire cars. Um, I went kind of on a search for what I thought was a good, you know, way to do that. I ended up meeting you and getting a demo of NQ and, you know, henceforth now a lot of our clients have NQ. Um, but the reason that I think it's important, like you said, is if you don't have any cars, you can't sell them. If you have the wrong cars, they won't sell. If they have the wrong yep. cars, gross profit will suffer. So, you know, I felt like it was a good uh, play for us to make a lot of introductions to you. And I think because of, uh, and again, I don't care if they use VinQ or not. I hope you don't mind me saying that. Just like you probably don't care if he uses us or not. It doesn't matter. What I care about is that the dealer has an eye and a focus on acquisition. Because if they're not buying cars and they're not doing it in a strategic way and they're not filling their lot with cars, then there's nothing to sell. And that's going to hurt. Listen, I, that's people too. If you don't have any cars to sell, not only is the net profit of that month going to hurt, you're going to lose employees. You're going to yep. lose, re, you know, retention rates going to be horrible. Then you got to, then when things start ramping back up again, all your good people left to go someplace aggressive. So I felt a kind of a fiduciary duty for all of my clients that have been with us for years um, to kind of step up and be that voice of reason and say, hey, you've got this problem. We're focusing on it. Here's a solution. And, you know, again, VinQ for me was a part of that acquisition strategy. Um, you know, as you know, you know, we do things in dealer funnel too, um, which, you know, shameless plug there again, I'm a, I'm a partner in, but we, you know, we do a lot of acquisition type of strategies there, but I actually find it's best if I have a, a tool like VinQ, um, you know, to be able to ship out in a link for somebody to go to and use that as an inbound, as you call it, right, as an inbound mm -hmm. lead. So, so acquisition was a really big part of that because I just felt dealers needed cars. Um, secondary to that, I'll tell you a, a little something that's worked for our clients is, you know, not having to spend a whole lot of money on uh, any kind of conquesting, right? You know, like right now, okay. We, we've been really focused up with our clients and the most successful ones. Now, granted, they've had some inventory. Uh, I've had a couple of clients that haven't had, uh, you know, hellacious inventory problems. Um, and but what we do is we've been really managing like how many cars are inbound and how many of those cars that are inbound are sold. We're tracking, as an example, the percentage of those inbounds that are sold so that we know what, what our responsibility is to try to sell, right? You know, to make sure that those, those, those turn quickly as well. Um, and then our strategies have really been around um, mining the database in any way that we can. Right. And the reason for that is, is you know, my, again, re responsibility to the dealers to keep them on path you know, not just for today and this month, but like the long term. And so, you know, let's not let our customers defect. 
Let's not let them go buy a car elsewhere when I have it. Let's not spend a dollar trying to get somebody three zip codes over to buy that car. I need the guy who's bought six cars from me to come in and buy that car that I have available right now and keep him in my family because he's loyal and that's continue right. to build those habits. So, you know, I think that's another thing that's that's important that we kind of kept a focus on is, you know, look, let's figure out how many cars we're going to have to try to sell and how many are pre-sold. And that changes. There's somebody listening that's like, hey, buddy, every car I get is pre-sold. I, I get it. Right. Um, but that's not every dealership, every manufacturer across, across the country. So we just kind of focus on that and then we leverage what that is. And again, goes back to being flat fee and nonlinear. We find the best way to try to sell those cars for the least amount of money and, you know, really mining the database uh, in intelligent ways, uh, you know, has, has proven very successful. Yeah. The least amount of money and spend, right? Yeah. The least um, amount of money and spend. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't, uh, I've never liked that, uh, thinking that I just have to keep lowering my prices to find bargain hunters. I think there, there's, this, just like there's, we talked about, there's a shift in experience. There's also a shift in value uh, because I know that my sister's 25 years old. She'll pay a little bit more to get what she wants and to have a good experience. Right. Um, those, those Trump, right. Uh, getting a, a deal. No, agreed. And a third, a third strategy here, which is radically different than anything we've ever done is look at it and say, hey, look, you have record profits, right? Um, most dealers right now are, are, are absolutely living in that land of like this utopian, holy crap, can't believe how good life is, record profits. And so, you know, instead of just kind of hardcore offer driven, you know, zero down 99 a month, you're approved, you know, kind of advertising, we're looking at that disruptor model again and saying, hey, now's the time to build your brand again so that, I, again, time to flip, that you were there. So they're taking some of that money, um, you know, some of them, not everyone, you know, again, not, this is by no means a blanket statement, but some of the aggressive stores really look at it like, hey, now's the time to go out and, and, and really kind of buy our market and build brand, become top of mind. Um, and kind of disrupt the disruptors and also take advantage of, you know, the, the, the sleepy guy who's not continuing to build his brand during these times because they yep. feel, and I think they're right, they feel like when times flip again that, you know, hey, I'm going to be there, I've been there, I've told my story, and my brand's going to be strong. And, you know, they're not taking all their profits, but they're taking, you know, 6% and throwing it back into branding. Exactly right. And I do think that's really smart. I, I, I really do. No matter how many cars you need to sell, don't sell, have pre-sold, don't need it, you know, continue to build your brand. You've been in business for 10 years, 12 years, 50 years, 100 years, you know, keep the brand, you know, out in the marketplace. I think that that is important. Yeah. No matter what your brand is, whether it's buy your paper, no whether that your brand is selling new cars, used cars, whether, uh, you know, you, you appeal to the audience um, that you have earned. Uh, over time based on, 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 on your dealership and your experience. So where do you think you and I talked about this a little bit uh, with electrification? Um, we started buying and selling electric cars about five years ago. We started really thinking about it. Uh, obviously started with uh, um, hybrids, but then plug-in hybrids and then electric cars, whether they be Volts and Teslas and so forth. And we found that that's the way we could get into that space, whether it be through educate ourselves in service, uh, because we would buy these cars and we'd figure out how to service them. And then we figure out, okay, what can we do from a customer perspective, uh, not just internal to stay relevant in that space? Um, I'm not on the new car side. What is it, what's your feeling with uh, electrification and how that's gonna change uh, the, the showroom as well as the service department? Well, I mean, I think you start to look at the logos of some companies, you know, Kia, General Motors, the, you know, Nissan even, um, you know, and, and the likes, you know, heck, we just redid our logo, um, you know, as a, as a vendor. So uh, I think it, it kind of starts there where you realize there is a very big shift going on in the world that's accepting where we're going. And, you know, where we're going is an interesting place. Uh, you know, when we spoke, I remember saying to you, uh, you know, look, people are going to have to get ready for the fact that a car doesn't need an oil change. It needs a software update. Um, and we can all sit there and shake our heads up and down, right? And go, yeah, you're right. 
But what does it mean to a family business? And again, you know, I exist as a company and we have since day one, you know, to help dealers that need help. If you don't need our help, then we're not a good fit. But, you know, I want to, I, I exist to be a company to help dealers that need help. And I think they need help understanding that because look, that's, that, that means there's no MPI. You know, the right. car in the driveway at the house getting a software update doesn't need an oil change. And what have we been teaching and preaching for years where, you know, we're, we're working on fixed absorption, right? And we're saying, hey, I want, I want to get my fixed absorption to 100%. And what was the typical way we always taught that? Well, like, let's get the car in the lane, put it up on a lift, do an MPI, <laughs> yep. you know, yep. red, yellow, green lights, you know, this needs to be replaced. And, you know, even when I was a GM, I used to tell my people like, you know, look, I never, ever, ever want you to sell somebody something they don't need, but I want to make sure that no one ever leaves that should have bought something that they do need. So right. we're going to get awesome at MPIs, you know, but again, don't sell for the sake of selling, sell because it's, you know, yellow about to turn red, right? But I think that that's going away. So when you talk about electrification, that's one thing. Another thing I think is, is, is a big uh, change is, this goes back to kind of the website and the relevancy thing. These consumers, I mean, it's just a, it's just a different mindset. It's a whole different way about doing business, how they go about the transaction. Uh, they probably are a little bit more digital retail esque. Um, I just think it's a really different mindset and a different experience that they're begging for throughout that process. And if you don't give that to them, no matter how good your electric car is. I don't think they're going to buy it. I think they're going to go right. buy the experience. I mean, if you think yes. about it, less and less and less. Buy the experience. That's that's exactly that's that's going to be. They're going to buy the experience. They're going to buy the experience. They are because we're taking away moving parts. I mean, physically taking away moving parts. Uh, you know, back in the day when I first started in the car business, I, I remember like in that 1987 place, I was at a Chevy store and a guy would walk in with a a, a Ford hat on and, you know, a, some guy in service would be like, what's that stand for? Fix or repair daily? <laughs> what are you doing here, pal? You know, and, right. and so we're taking away the moving parts that cause that brand loyalty, right? Think about, I mean, if I can't tell you that the engine in a Ford is better than in the engine in a Chevy and a she a, uh, the engine in a Toyota is a better than an engine in an X, we're taking away that whole brand experience and they're going to have to like the car, like the look, believe, and, but they're going to buy the freaking experience. They're going to say, it's cool to drive that car. That's what's going to drive them. It's cool to drive that car. And I no longer need to listen to my dad or my grandpa tell me that that engine isn't worth the crap. So it's a whole different way that we're going about buying cars. And again, you know, we're starting to, with our clients, starting to say, hey, look, we know you're not there yet. You're not going to be at 50% EV sales by June. But, you know, we need to look five years ahead. We need to prepare your brand. Your family has been in business for 100 years I don't want to see you, you know, have that fall apart because you weren't ready for this incredibly crazy shift that's about to happen. And and look, you know, not to get too long-winded or passionate, Danny, but you know, I've watched all these things happen in the last 35 years. More is going to change in the next five than happened in the first 35. And and I don't think I couldn't a lot agree of people, more. I, and and the problem with it isn't that people don't believe it; they're doing nothing about it. Because times are so good, they're breaking records, shake, you know, high five in each other, you know, all. And I'm saying this is great, things are wonderful, but my goodness, can we pay attention to where you're going to be six months from now when inventories really do start to come back? And let's hope it's that, right? I know everybody's got a varying opinion of when that'll be, but let's use six to nine months to twelve months, you know, as as a barometer there. So where are you going to be when? That happens. And, and again, I'll get a little long-winded here. I'll, I'll, I'll ramble for a second. We pulled ahead of how many people? As if you we're say, we, records, we robbed from them. our future, right? Is that what you said? We robbed from our future, Danny. I mean, yep. if you don't think so, you're crazy. There's times when we've had two or three really, really good, strong months and broke records, and we thought we robbed from our future. But And, and we used to all talk about it. Like, I don't know. I think we might have pulled a few people ahead there. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we've we've had 15 to 18 months of record-breaking, shattering months. We have pulled as many, I'm not saying as many people. I mean, there's always an infinite amount of possibilities. But we've pulled more people ahead than we've ever pulled ahead. 
And Absolutely. while we pulled them ahead, we grossed them too. Yep. So I remember every- what it felt like to go through cash for clunkers 18 months later, 24 months later. And that was this small. Hey, Danny, the difference though, happened. the difference is this, they had a government $4,500 benefit then. And the dealer, you know, even if they didn't discount the car, it was an additional $4,500 rebate. Right. Yep. Right yep. now we've added $4,500 to the price of the car. Uh, yeah. That, and that's a low number. I'm seeing uh, market increases upwards of on new cars across the street from me, uh, $10,000 market adjustments. So if across the country, the average gross profit is just up an extra three grand, four grand, wh- where's in equity 18 months from now? When inventory's back, we pulled everybody ahead, we're yep. striving for business, and everybody that does come in is looking to get out of the car that they bought at 2%. Rates go up to three nine or something, and they're upside down by you know I don't know some is seventeen grand unusual to you know uh, they're going to be upside down. So I just think we're headed towards this place where, look, I hope I'm wrong. I honest to God hope I'm wrong. But if I'm not wrong, I just think a dealer needs to be thinking about it today and having a strategy for how they're going to attack that. Yes. Um, and, and that goes back to the question of electrification. I mean, there's a lot going to change, and electrification is going to be part of it. But I think that's the quicker problem. I think electrification, right. is, you think about five or six years from now, is being really, really, really adopted in high, you know, high number, high, high percentage mm-hmm. numbers. The bigger problem is going to be in that two to three year range in the trade, the next trade cycle. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm lucky we're on the same team because uh, there, you're you're absolutely right. And uh, being in this business. Uh, has never been more fun for me, uh, but it's also uh, never had more opportunity than it has today for for change. And so, uh, you know, it's funny you I say that because I again we're on the same page. Like it's, I wouldn't say it got boring, but when things were monotonous and over and over and over mm-hmm. and over again and zero down ninety nine a month, we'll get you approved. Yep. And you know, yep. Grand Cherokees of this and Tacomas of that, and like it it did get a little monotonous. And uh, I've always enjoyed it, but. I do find it more fun right now because like I'm a strategic, like I, Art of War is one of my favorite books. I love playing chess. Like this is a moment where, you know, you got to think and you got to, you got to play the game. And I think I'm enjoying it more than ever. Yeah. Well, you're doing a really good job and you're helping a lot of people. And I hope that um, those that have listened to this today or those that are going to be listening to it another day, maybe in the car or at home, um, have taken a bunch of notes because, um, a friend of mine said this to me, you're either, you either have a seat at the table or you're on the menu. Uh, and I, <laughs> That's a good one. And I, yeah. And I don't want to, even if I have the inventory, right. I don't one day want to be a inventory warehouse for some online company to take, to, to set my own margins. I'm not interested. I always want to have a front door. I always want to uh, uh, help uh, in and be relevant within my community. So um, well, look, you guys are doing a lot of things right. And if I could give you a little plug, uh, uh, you know, I would just tell people if you're, if you're looking at marketing, like your YouTube channel and the things that you, that you've done, even before, you know, before you met us, I mean, I'd like to think that we're going to be a part of the, the future of helping you, but you do so many things right out of the gates. It's a fun account for us to work on. Cause we're on the same page. Thanks. And I think anybody who, you know, wants to kind of see what a dealership, you know, operates, looks like, feels like should mystery shop Country Hill Motors. I hope you don't mind me throwing that out there because, you, you know, Please do. Cause I think we're on the same on page to help people be better. But I think yeah. people should shop your store and and get a sense of what you're doing and look at your YouTube uh, channel and, and just kind of see what that vibe and energy of that store is, because you guys are definitely on the right path. Thank you. Well, with that, um, Troy, thank you very, very much for spilling your heart here. Um, one of my questions uh, to end with was going to be uh, <laughs> what makes you happy. But I feel yeah. like you've spent the last 45 minutes answering that question. Hey, you uh, know what? I'm lucky. I'll answer it very quickly. Um, I'm really lucky that my wife knows who she's married to um, <laughs> because uh, my, fa- my family is what makes me happy. Uh, you know, I have kind of a family business. My two daughters work with us. My sister-in-law works with us. My mother, you know, it's no secret. I don't hide that from people. Um, you know, we're, we're a, a hardworking bunch of people, a bunch of group of people 
Uh, we do love what we do. You can tell my passions here, but you know, if I, I don't do a lot, I spend time with my family and I work occasionally I play golf. Um, but, uh, I've been doing less and less and less of that because this is this, this last 18 months was like, I, I, I rejoined the country club thinking because of COVID and lack of inventory, it's going to have some time to play golf. Well, the exact yeah. opposite happened. You know, yep. I, this chess match, this strategy game got a hold of me and I've been working harder than ever. And, uh, so yeah, family makes me smile. This really does make me smile for what it's worth. And, uh, play in a little occasional round of golf. Well, uh, let's keep on doing this. Yeah, man. I think it's going to be fun. Oh, you know, so. it's going to be a wild ride. And um, I think it's going to eat some people's lunch. Um, they're going to yep. be on the menu, you know, and uh, I, I, I'd i like to, like I said, I'd like to mount the march of helping as many people be on the, you know, ordering side than versus a be on the menu side. That's what I'll spend the next 10 years of my life doing. I'm and I'm honored to be on the same train with you, sir. Back at you, pal. And thank you, Michael, right. for putting this together. So thank you very much. Um, if anybody has uh, questions or wants to get a hold of you, how do they do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, easiest way is, uh, I mean, if they're watching on like Facebook Live, you know, friend me, mm -hmm. PM me, DM me, whatever you call that. Text me okay. um, at 610 570 three zero two two that's six one zero five seven zero three zero two two i answer every single one of my texts back to everybody it's just the easiest way to reach me or um you know go to mydealerworld.com and and uh, fill out the contact form it comes to me and, and and the rest of my team but you know it comes to me as well and i'll get back that's awesome we're gonna put this up on our website and uh, we'll also put it in the comments so that, that we can get a hold of you. Uh, and if anybody has questions about how uh, Deal World works with Country Hill Motors, uh, I encourage you, you can call me or, or actually talk to my marketing team. Uh, and you can hear firsthand the, the results that you guys are driving for us. So, so thank you for that. And excited to keep disrupting together, sir. You got it, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You too. Hey, hey, Merry Christmas, too. I don't know what everybody celebrates. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, all of it. Uh, just it's a holiday season. I also love that. It's good family time. So yep. hope everybody enjoys holiday. Enjoy. So take care. See you. See you. Bye.